Welcome, everyone. I'm Gergely Rajnai. I'm going to be moderating this debate. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome uh, the two colleagues, uh, uh, Karoj Mike from uh, ELTE and uh, Christoph Kuzmich from the University of Graz. And we are going to be talking about how markets work, uh, whether they work well, whether they are efficient, uh, and also whether they are just, whether they work well for everybody, not just work uh, well as a whole. Um, so uh, the way the debate will be working is uh, both of uh, our colleagues, both of my colleagues will have a short speech to begin, short uh, list of arguments uh, they make. And then we are going to call, uh, follow up with a discussion, debate on uh, those concepts that they are introducing. Uh, and then in the end, we are going to have a Q&A. So uh, pay attention. And then if you have any questions that arise throughout the debate, uh, Feel free to ask them once we get to the Q&A, and then uh, we can have a discussion with you as well. OK? So uh, let's begin. Christoph, please uh, take it away. Thank you very much for uh, uh, this introduction. Let me uh, say a few things before I tell you a bit about uh, starting the debate. I don't know how much of a debate we're going to have. We don't, we don't hate each other, OK? So <laughs> as far as I can tell. <laughs> but we will try and make this a bit interactive. We'll see how this goes. I don't mind if you have questions in between, although you said you should have them at the end. But um, if you have something urgent, actually, I, I am better with uh, responses in some sense than if I just monologue and say stuff and say stuff. And I feel like I get lost a little bit, like I just am getting lost now. OK, so uh, but let me say a little bit before, uh, so just in case you're interested where I'm coming from. So I actually studied math initially in Graz, in my hometown. And then I studied finance in Vienna. Then I went to do my PhD in Cambridge uh, in the UK in economics. So I gradually moved towards economics, towards more the social sciences. I found this more and more interesting. I was also very puzzled about math. And it's very useful in economics, it turns out. Also useful even in politics now and political science. So I don't know if you can ask me about this more later if you want. But um, and then I did my first job was uh, as an assistant professor at the Northwestern University, where I met Peter Escher, who you will see later, and Julian. <laughs> and um, then I moved, uh, after eight years or so being there, I moved uh, to Bielefeld as a professor of economics, and then I moved back to Graz, which is not a true career that you can usually have in academics. It's hard to to end up in the same place that you were born in. This is unusual. <laughs> OK. Um, OK, but anyway, so let me um, uh, now start a little bit about uh, this debate. So I want to first talk a little bit about, um, so this is about, I don't know, it doesn't say our subtext here, but this is supposed to be about regulations and rules, OK? And let me start first say a little bit about what economics knows, or we think we know, where we don't need rules and regulations, OK? So there are a few things that we feel we just let everybody do what they want to do, and that should be fine. So what are these situations? So for example, we think that every farmer and, you know, should just do what they want to do, and we, shouldn't, we don't have to necessarily interfere with that. And everybody should just buy whatever produce they want to buy. We don't have to tell people what products to buy. They just do what they do. So this is sort of where we think there's a sort of free market that doesn't need to be regulated. Nobody needs to poke it. You just let people do what they do. And it will end up so that if people like uh, tomatoes, OK, then people will grow more tomatoes. And then this will somehow solve the problem of you know, people wanting to have those things. So I think there are many markets that have a little bit this feature. So if you buy your milk, your toothpaste, your uh, aftershave, <laughs> uh, your toiletries, your uh, bread, OK, all these things probably don't need to be hugely regulated. Uh, why not? What are the key features that these markets have? Well, they have two things that some markets don't have. Uh, they have what's called no externalities. What does this mean? This means that um, when you buy your uh, bread, nobody else cares. Okay? <laughs> nobody else is affected by the fact that you are now buying some bread. This is sort of the idea. You can debate everything. Actually, everything is... All I'm saying is not completely true, by the way. Okay? Maybe I should say this to the beginning. <laughs> not, <laughs> nothing I say cannot be also said that, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, sometimes I don't like my brother eating bread in front of me because, you know, I hear the noise and <laughs> it's very annoying. <laughs> so, okay, so there's always a caveat. Okay? But in principle, when you buy your bread, I don't really care that much. So you can just do what you do. Of course, there are markets where this is not the case, right? So if you drive your car, you might kill me. OK, so in that sense, I might be affected, even though I'm not in, I'm not party of this uh, purchase decision that you make. When you decide to buy your car, you're not asking me, uh, am I allowed to buy your car? I would say maybe, ah, you know what? No, don't buy your car. I'd rather you don't have a car. I'd rather be the only one driving in the city, in fact. Okay? Uh, this would be better for me. 
Um, so we can come back to this. So this is a case where you have what's called negative externalities. A decision that you make affects others. I mean, similar things you know. I mean, this is not, this is not just economics, but if you, for example, go to a public park with your music, okay, and you, dunk, 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 and you make it loud and everything for everybody, maybe they like it, maybe they don't, okay? So it's not so clear. Uh, this has the externalities. There are also something what's called positive externalities. Imagine you live in Budapest and in very old times and there is no bridge. You're not going to build a bridge. Even though you want to get across the other side, <clears throat> you're not just going to, you know, a bridge is expensive. I mean, this is a huge amount of effort to build a bridge. You might like to go the other side, but you're probably not going to do it. You're probably going to take a boat and, you know, it's going to be tricky and stuff, but, you know, it's cheaper. So it makes sense, and this is a little bit where it goes towards politics. So when you have positive externalities, that um, you probably uh, are going to see that people don't build bridges enough, in some sense. Okay. So this is one thing that you're going to have um, that that would maybe make uh, it good to interfere with this market a little bit, right? So the market for bridges or the market for uh, cars. Okay, maybe one should interfere a little bit. We can talk a little bit about how. One could interfere. Maybe I'll let this be part of the debate later. We'll see. Um, and um, then there's a second thing, which is a bit more subtle. It's not so good to have a market when you have what's called asymmetric information. What does that mean? That means that the buyer of the product knows different things than the seller of the product. For example, suppose you, I mean, the best example is always, I think, still, you're trying to sell your, your car, second-hand car. You used it a lot, okay? And now you're trying to sell it. And you're trying to sell it to me. And you say, ah, I'm going to give it to you for this much. Okay? I say, but you know, how do I know it's a good car still? Okay? Why are you selling it to me? Why is it so cheap? Okay? <laughs> is there something wrong with the car? I mean, I don't know this necessarily. Right? And if you have these situations, then it might be that actually, even though you have a perfectly good car to sell to me, I don't believe you. And I'm worried and I don't buy it. Or you have to accept this very low price that I'm offering okay? if, because you literally need to get rid of it. So this is, uh, these are two cases of what we call in economics market failures. When you have these externalities and you have uh, um, asymmetric information, for both of these reasons, markets can fail to do what I said before, that they just work without anybody interfering as well as possible. So um, these are things I would want to come back to. This is where we begin to have political processes needed to, say, to regulate this. Okay? So maybe let me give one example. I don't know how much time I'm supposed to take. <laughs> so let's go back to the cars. So how do we solve this problem society in, this in society? Right? So, uh, some people like to have their cars and they like to drive as fast as possible, right? And if you let everybody just drive as fast as they want, I think it'd be a bit of a mess. I mean, that's the idea. But what, what can we do? I mean, you all know what we can do, right? We can impose speed limits. But you don't unilaterally impose a speed limit. This is a political decision, right? So, we, we, but you might be happy, if you want, yeah, to say, look, I'm happy to have a speed limit. Ideally, I would be exempt myself, okay? So my dream would be that everybody else goes 100 on the autobahn, but I can go 200, okay? This would be my dream, but this is unrealistic, okay? So I might be happy to accept that there's a speed limit that we all have to adhere to. And I might actually vote for this if I have, you know, if there's a, if there's a decision to be made socially, right? Nobody knows exactly uh, what speed limit everybody would like, right? So then we could have a vote, we could say, look, uh, why don't we all uh, get together? I mean, in, in, uh, this is not usually what. Maybe I should start a little bit like this. So in Austria, we don't vote on these issues. Okay, we vote for parties and they implement things. And maybe this is one of the things on the agenda. Uh, I think it's similar in Hungary. In Switzerland, they have sometimes more direct democracy, right? Where you vote every weekend, you vote on something. Maybe it's a bit too much, a bit of an overkill. You can never go on holiday on the weekend. You always have to vote on something. But uh, yeah, this is a bit of an interesting tension. But you could imagine that. Um, if we did have to vote on the speed limit, we probably wouldn't set it to infinity. We'd probably say, yeah, you know what, we, maybe in Germany they would, but maybe here and other places they wouldn't, okay, we'd say, yes, we would like to have a speed limit that is uh, below, uh, I don't know, 130 on the Autobahn or something. So this is where uh, the social pro I mean, the political process can help solve this market failure. So this is a little bit, uh, I guess, hopefully what you will learn a little bit also in this program between economics and uh, politics. Maybe this is for enough as a starting point for me, and we can always talk about more stuff later. Yeah. Thank you, Christoph. And then now Karoy uh, would uh, introduce some other arguments or other perspectives on the same issue. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so Christoph started with very practical issues, and I think he, as usually economists do, he tried to give some practical reasons why the government should or shouldn't do this or that thing. 
what I would like to add is maybe a less practical, but a more, maybe moral or ethical point of view. So we, ha we end up with some kind of regulation, maybe a regulation about what kind of cars we can use. Now, is this a good regulation? Do we have some criterion about which we can agree? And um, I propose uh, that uh, we focus on a concept which is really an ancient one, but also a very modern one, the concept of justice. Okay? For example, nowadays people often speak about climate justice. So we have maybe a regulation, perhaps one about cars. Maybe we prohibit the use of uh, traditional cars that run on petrol or diesel. Uh, so there is a policy related to climate, and we can ask, is this a just policy or unjust policy? Okay, but why justice? Why do we care about justice? Uh, perhaps our first thought is that this is a very idealistic and lofty concept. But what I would like to suggest that, in fact, this is a very basic and fundamental concept uh, for society. Actually, the founding father of economics, Adam Smith, thought that justice is fundamental for the functioning of society. He said that, oh, it's nice to live in a society where people are friendly and helpful with one another, but we can actually manage without these nice things. But if people are unjust with one another, then society will very soon collapse, self-destruct. So in this sense, he thought this is something very basic. Uh, so w what is it? Uh, what is justice in this fundamental sense that we can have as a sort of basic expectation uh, for a policy? Now, there are very many theories of justice about which you will surely learn uh, in this program. But actually, the concept, the very word comes from the Latin justitia. And this comes from use, which means right. So justice or justitia is uh, in its most basic form about respecting the rights of other people. I act justly with you if I give you what is due to you, what I owe you. So in a sense, it's about the minimum obligations we have towards uh, one another. Okay, but then when, when am I just? Can we have any criterion? Now, I think it's good to go back to the roots, um, for example, to Aristotle, who suggested a very practical criterion. He said that when I do something to you and you accept it voluntarily, what I do to you, then it's very likely that I am just. I do not break the requirement of justice. Why? Because, according to Aristotle, Perhaps we can agree on this. People do not wish to suffer injustice voluntarily. Okay? So we have the criterion of voluntariness. When we have two people and their relationship is voluntary, then we can safely assume that they are just with one another. Okay, but when we have a regulation, for example, regulation about cars, that's a decision that affects maybe millions of people. So what is voluntariness in this context? One possible interpretation is that we need consensus. If everybody agrees, for example, all people vote, but really all of them unanimously agree to regulation, nobody objects to it, then it uh, may be just according to this criterion. Okay, so is this a good criterion? As usual, you can think of some objections. And it's not bad, but we could do better. Okay, uh, let me raise three problems. One is that, for example, even if all people in Hungary agree about such a regulation prohibiting petrol-fueled cars, there might be some people left out. Who? For example, we might have car makers in other countries and they do not vote. But even if we go for a kind of global consensus, everybody agrees in the world, we still have people left out. <coughs> Who? 
the future generations. Okay? Do they have a right? I suppose yes. So an important issue of justice is how we somehow include the preferences of people who are not yet there. Okay, but even if we somehow manage to solve this very tricky issue, we have maybe the really the worst problem, which is that consensus just doesn't work. It's not possible. Okay? Can we ever agree five or 10 million people about anything? Probably we would keep discussing, not for one hour like here, but for ages and ages and never come to any uh, concrete decision. Okay, that's really bad news for justice. Okay, so then the question is, what are possible remedies? And uh, I would like to suggest sort of three general types, uh, very briefly, three principles. Okay, uh, what do we do instead of a consensus typically in democracy? We resort to a majority rule, right? But when we have majority, we also have a minority who do not agree, so we have really no guarantee for justice under a majority rule. Okay? So we need principles that somehow complement or restrain what the majority trying to exploit and harm a minority. Now, one thing we can do, I think that relates to what uh, Christoph started with, is that we just don't make a collective decision whenever possible. We leave it to people, to individuals, maybe pairs of people. In the case of a car, we leave it to the buyer and the seller whenever we can. Okay? They produce whatever car they want and they buy whatever car they want. Or maybe smaller groups like companies, small communities. Why? Because they can more e easily agree voluntarily. But then we have a limit, and the limit is what economists call externalities, when we have two people agreeing about buying a certain type of car, but it has negative effects on others who have not agreed. Bad air pollution, greenhouse gases, etc. So from this perspective, this seems a policy in the direction of justice, doesn't it? Okay, so that's really an issue we should probably deal with. Okay, second uh, principle, do not give unlimited power to any current majority. Okay? Do not let any majority do whatever they want. How can you constrain majority? You have political, constitutional rules. Maybe not one, but two houses of legislature. Maybe have a constitutional court. Maybe have different levels of government local, regional, national, maybe supranational, who have some say. So make sure that all important minorities have some say in the process. Okay? Now, if you focus on this, you don't focus on the content of the rule. Is it uh, petrol-fueled cars or electric cars, whatever? But you focus on the procedure of how you reach the rule. Okay? Third principle is now about the content of the law or policy adopted by the majority. The principle is this, try to adopt general rules rather than rules or policies that specifically, concretely tell people what to do. Let's consider this uh, uh, regulation. You are prohibited to buy a petrol-fueled car. You must buy an electric car. Is this general? First, it seems general because it applies to everyone. But if you think about it, it actually applies, strictly speaking, or in effect, to those people who wouldn't buy an electric car. Those who would buy an electric car anyway are not affected. Okay. So what could be a more general regulation? Uh, one proposal is uh, to allow people to buy whatever cars they want, but make them pay a tax according to the air pollution or greenhouse emission they make. Maybe a tax on the petrol or a tax when you purchase a car according to the technical conditions. This might be a more general and thus more just uh, regulation. Okay, so to sum it up, in democracy with majority rules, 
make collective decisions only when really very necessary, restrain the majority, and third, try to adopt general rules. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so one concept was uh, missing for me in both of your uh, respective exposés. Um, and this concept is important, I think, because uh, for most arguments for more regulation, this is something that comes up all the time, and it's inequality. Okay, so, especially from the justice perspective, a lot of people would argue that regulations are necessary because we are not, in, we are not equal. We have economic inequality, social inequality, and so on. People are very different. So they cannot really voluntarily agree because they are, they are in different situations, and then the state or some other actor has to intervene. But also in terms of efficiency, you know, in the market, uh, like Christoph said, the market normally works very well uh, in a lot of uh, different areas. But what if there is, let's say, one large corporation that dominates one area, and then all the inefficiencies are coming in, and then new actors cannot uh, create this uh, great efficient market that you were uh, mostly talking about. So, uh, from an efficiency or from a justice perspective, how would you uh, deal with inequality if all we have is voluntarily, volu voluntarily entering into agreements? Um, okay, can I start a little bit? <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, inequality is a big issue. I mean, so when I say so, when markets sort them sort things out efficiently, as you call the word, so it means they I sort it they just sorted things out well. So they so what what do I mean by this, right? So maybe we should um, uh, explain this a bit more carefully, and then I can explain a little bit what the problem could be with maybe a Taylor Swift concert, <laughs> okay? Because this is something we can maybe understand. <laughs> so because there we have not really a market, okay? Because Taylor Swift is not a market. It's just one person who decides what the tickets would be priced, okay? <laughs> so, but let's start. So if usually the idea is that what does the market do? A market is such that some people produce potatoes and some people eat potatoes and there will be a price for potatoes. And this price will be such that just as many people will want to produce potatoes as people will want to eat potatoes. The price will be like this, okay? It will be adjust so that this happens. So this means, what does this mean? So if the price is, let's say, and we have experienced this now, right, with the wheat crisis a little bit, okay? So, you know, there's this global war, as you may have been aware, so, <laughs> or somewhat global. <laughs> but anyway, so there is, um, uh, the wheat has been fluctuating, right, the wheat supply, and so that means prices are fluctuating. So is this good or bad? I mean, of course, it means that the people, so what does it mean? So in the end, it means there's a price, and it's such that everybody who values wheat above this price will buy the wheat, okay? And there is everybody below will not, okay? And, uh, and, and then all the wheat that is there will be eaten. This is sort of how the idea that would work, okay? Now, is this fair? This is maybe a question, right? Well, the people who don't buy, we say, well, it, so the problem is a little bit that, I wouldn't call this fair, okay? So maybe one should maybe make be very clear, efficiency and fairness to me have nothing to do with each other. It just means that, um, uh, so yes, there are some people who can't buy wheat, uh, others have more willingness to pay for wheat, maybe because they are wealthier, okay? And is this fair? No, probably not. But, <laughs> but it's, uh, what does it mean if it went like this? So let me then go back to the Taylor Swift concert. I'd rather take not so emotional things as examples. Um, so if you think of a Taylor Swift concert, I don't know whether you were following this, but she uh, had this, she was gonna go on this tour and uh, there, were this, there was this outrage in the US. I don't know, this was even an issue in Congress, I think, in the US. They were talking about Taylor Swift concerts in the big public debates. Uh, why? Because the, the tickets were too cheap. I think that's really the end result, okay? So, but it means there were ticket prices for Taylor Swift concerts and she cannot give so many concerts, okay? And every concert is just, there's a limit as to how many people can go. And what it meant was that, I don't know what the ticket prices were, they were probably outrageously high anyway, right? But nevertheless, more people wanted to go to these concerts than there were tickets. So is this fair? So what does it mean? What, in the end, what you have is that you spend um, a microsecond on, online, right? And you click and you want a ticket. And there are so many stories about people like, ah, I wanted a ticket and I clicked and I was there and I was online and nothing happened. And I, I don't know, things froze and ah. And so there were probably, I don't know, three, four, five times as many people wanting tickets who could get them. And all these people who didn't get tickets were feeling really bad, okay, about this. And they would say, this is all unfair. It's again, not unfair. It's just not efficient. Okay, so what economists would say then, what the price should have been probably higher, okay? The price should have risen and risen and risen to the point where uh, many people will say, ah, I no longer need a ticket, okay? <laughs> so I don't, this is too expensive for me. So then it would have been what if economists would have called efficient, okay? But again, it would have been who goes into these concerts? 
it's maybe not the poor but very enthusiastic Taylor Swift fans, it's the people who can afford it also, okay? So, yeah, these things don't really solve the efficient inequality problem. I think I would like to continue on the Taylor Swift uh, line <laughs> because um, I think it's, 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 it's important, this, this phenomenon, because the other issue with that was that there were ticket scalpers who would buy up all the tickets and then would sell it for enormous prices, sure. right? Who, who, and, and this was also not really efficient in a way, because then let's say one person buys all the tickets because he has a very good internet connection and has like a algorithm that can ensure that and then buys up all the tickets and then resells it for whatever price uh, he or she wants to. So that's also inefficient in Actually, in a this way. is actually, if this works perfectly, this would be efficient. Okay, so if, if I, if, if Taylor ticket, so let's say Taylor Swift prices are super cheap, let's say, Okay, and um, I buy them all, let's say. For some reason, I am the best machinery and I can you know, do this and I scrape and I get all the tickets and I then sell them at the price where exactly as many tickets, so that I sell exactly all the tickets and no, nobody else wants a ticket. So everybody would, it's just the right number of people that exactly want to buy my ticket. Then actually, this is what we would call an efficient allocation. I mean, it's not fair or anything, okay? So this has nothing, but it's, but who gets it? Why is it efficient? So it's a, we would call it an improvement, right? If I have a ticket that I don't need and I sell it to you and you want it. This is, we're coming back to Carolis, like this is a voluntary transaction, right? You don't have to buy my ticket at this outrageous price, but if you do, apparently you like it at this price. So this is an uh, efficiency enhancing, it's an improvement. It's an improvement for me, I got, I got more money. It's improvement for you, you got the ticket that you wanted at the price, I mean at the high price, but yes, but you still want it apparently, right? You don't, nobody forces you to buy it. So that's improving. So efficiency should not be confused with fairness, okay? Okay, so you say that in this case, inequality is efficient. I wouldn't say. So the because <laughs> there is, it's. I, no, I think the, given the inequality, this allocation is efficient, okay? So it doesn't mean that uh, we should have inequality. There are other reasons why we have inequality, and I'm not sure I'm happy with it necessarily, but, uh, but yeah. Okay, so we shouldn't confuse the two topics. That's, yeah, that's I think the most so. Important. And then, so is inequality just if it's only a result of voluntary transactions? Well, inequality is, is a state, right? When you, are we unequal here? Maybe we look at uh, the income, the money income or the wealth each one of us has. Uh, so it's a, a kind of situation in which we end up. Right? This is how we usually, I think, uh, look at inequality. But very different processes can lead to inequality. For example, to Taylor S Swift? Yes, mm -hmm. I, I think I know who she is. <laughs> uh, she's probably very rich, okay? So certainly much richer probably than, than I am. Uh, is this bad? Okay. Then we look at another rich person, um, who made money maybe from something else, okay? So when is it a problem? When is it not a problem? There are usually people whose performance we very clearly uh, like and we think, yes, he or she really deserved this money. I mean, would you say that Taylor Swift shouldn't be giving concerts and making this much money? People like that. She probably doesn't cause harm to too many people. Or- It was an uh, earthquake, apparently, but- sorry? She caused a little earthquake at some point, but okay. Oh, yes, so there, there might be side, side effects. Or speaking of electric cars, you know, there are very rich people who were very uh, innovating. They developed new types of cars, which we might think they are really good things. Okay, so uh, how can we distinguish between good processes leading to inequality and bad processes? I think that's more the question. And when we have voluntary transactions, okay, let's stick to Taylor Swift, um, what, what, what does it mean? So it's good for Taylor Swift, he enjoy, she enjoys singing and she makes money, also she can employ a lot of people, maybe she cares about it too, but also it's good for the concert goers, for the fans. So both of them benefit, both of them are, are better off. Okay, and it's also, uh, so apart from improving the situation, the welfare of people. It's also just in the sense that everybody involved, apart from the neighbors who don't like noise, at least these ones, uh, participate voluntarily. Their rights are not uh, broken. So we have justice. 
Now, can you think of a bad case? When we don't have a voluntary transaction, but I still make a lot of money, how is it possible? Basically, by taking it away from you, by forcing you through violence, or maybe through means you don't really agree with. I cheat you. Uh, I'm the only supplier, not because I was so innovating, <laughs> but I just happened to be lucky, and I, and I asked for an very high prices. Maybe I have the whole... I, I'm the only landowner in the country, I'm the only one producing food, and I ask for very high prices. So I take advantage of my position. So I would make this distinction. Do people get rich, and do we have inequality as a result? Because they give other people something they like in a voluntary transaction, or do they get rich because they do harm and exploit other people? So we can make this distinction. So it's good, good, both good and bad inequality. Can I add something to this? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Um, I like this a lot. So, I mean, I completely agree with this distinction that um, it's quite different if, like, say, Taylor Swift, she produces something, everybody goes there voluntarily, and so she perhaps deserves all the money she makes, right? I mean, everybody is giving it to her voluntarily. It's quite different from, say, somebody who had, let's say, a monopoly on sugar or something, right? Suppose there was one person who sold all the sugar in the world. It would be outrageously high prices, and they would make a lot of money with this without any effort. It just doesn't, you don't have to think deeply. You don't have to innovate. You don't have to write a song, <laughs> okay? You don't have to dance, nothing. <laughs> you just have to, you know, sell sugar that you, you apparently own all the sugar, okay? So, I mean, you could argue that maybe sugar should have a higher price because, you know, there's this externality that we all become a little bit obese, perhaps, because if we eat too much sugar. But this is, a, you know, I guess I told you, everything I say can be construed as wrong. So, um, but, um, so I agree with this. But there, so this reminds me of a distinction. I had this debate a lot with uh, PhD students when I was uh, in Chicago and uh, in, in Cambridge, that um, there were all these Chileans who said they have this very unfair society because there are so many people who are barred from getting an education. This is very unfair. It actually, there's nothing to do with unfairness. This is inefficient. So what does it mean? So, but, so what I'm talking about is like there's uh, different notions of fairness, right? There's sort of allocative fairness. Everybody should get the same stuff. Or there's sort of more of a, um, a priori fairness, like an, everybody should have the same chances. Of course, the same chances don't help everybody equally, okay? So, I mean, for example, I can have all the chances in the world to become a famous basketball player, but I'm just not tall enough. Okay, there's nothing I can do. I mean, even if I allow, I mean, I, I'm allowed to go into these basketball academies and whatnot. I mean, yes, I could, but it doesn't help me because I just don't have this in, intrinsic um, 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 characteristic that is needed, I guess. But so what I'm saying is that so there's this, the idea is that if you have access, so even if you have uh, access to everything, you have sort of ex ante, sort of what you call it, uh, procedural fairness, everybody's allowed to do the same thing, let's say you've access to everything, this does not give you an equal society, right? I mean, so it depends on your skills, right? If you are only the 159,000th best musician, you're not making as much money. I mean, if the, the, the music industry is very skewed, right? So there are very few people in the top make a lot of money, the rest not so much. Is this fair? No, probably not, right? But uh, this is what you would get. You will still get... Um, so even if this ex-ante notion of fairness does not give you equal societies. I don't know whether mm -hmm. um, this fits here a little bit, I thought. Can some regulations increase this kind of fairness cool. in some respects <laughs> from both the justice and the efficiency perspective that some people just don't have access to, let's say, education, <laughs> just giving a little bit of more access by regulation, by regulating who goes to university and who can go and who can get, get subsidized and some, so, so on. Can, can't we get to a more fair and even more efficient society? Can I start? Yes. <laughs> I mean, so education is an interesting thing a little bit. So, because education is probably something where you have what's called positive externalities. But if you get a good education, let's say you, uh, uh, but not just, not just high education, like say if there's a plumber that gets a good education in plumbing, that's great for me because I can hire a plumber who can fix stuff for me, right? So in that sense, all education probably has a little bit of a positive externality. And because of this, it's probably a good idea to subsidize education. Not different countries they disagree I mean, on these things a little bit, right? But, um, um, and it's also a question as to how much you should subsidize. I mean, should you subsidize somebody who will then later make a lot of money in finance, let's say? I don't know. You can argue that maybe that's not something you should subsidize. Okay, but um, so there are policies you can do, of course, to, to improve this. Um, to, um, so you can subsidize, but uh, 
then to address this, if you want a more exposed um, fairness in some sense, you can of course tax, and that's what we all do, right? We all have most countries in the world have progressive tax systems. So people with a higher income make uh, pay more taxes. The problem with this is if you want to do this in one country, I mean, for example, if you look at Austria and we have our most famous sports people in Austria, where do they live and where do they pay their taxes? In Monaco or in Switzerland. In Switzerland, you can go to Switzerland and you can agree on your own tax deal if you're rich enough. You can say, you know, they, they, when Michael Schumacher moved to Switzerland, they were negotiating with him, the tax authorities. So what, how much tax will you want to pay? Okay, and so, because it's still great, right? If you, suppose you're a small country, this is a problem the EU has at the moment with San Marino, uh, Liechtenstein, and uh, Monaco, and Andorra. They have this agreement, so they, these countries, the little countries especially, would like to attract somebody like Michael Schumacher to live there. Right? Because they would probably spend a lot of money there and, you know, and so build and stuff, and that would be great for them. But the other countries in the EU probably don't want this to happen, right? So, um, so it's a, there's a limit as to what you can do. You have to do this a little bit more globally, I guess, right? But, um, yeah. Yes. Okay, so if, if justice is about respecting one another's basic rights, then you have the question, what are our rights? Like, does any Hungarian citizen have a right to free higher education? Should, should we have such a right? Is it part of our rights? I think there are no sort of general theoretical answers to this uh, question. Um, sometimes this is posed in terms of human rights. Right? We can probably easily agree that everybody should have a right to survival. So if, if somebody is dying because of starvation, then he or she should even have the right maybe to steal or force others. So we can agree about these basic rights. And then the question is how far a society extends these rights? Where do we stop? Okay? So right to free low-level education, higher education. But then, okay, you get free higher education, but then you make little money. Maybe because you become university professor rather than a financial analyst, so you make less money. Okay? So should I have the right to the same income, the same living circumstances as someone who makes more money? How far do we extend these rights? And the more we extend them, the more we also put obligations on others and on ourselves. Okay? Where do we end? We end with completely egalitarian society where nobody can grow in any uh, respect above uh, the others. We probably don't want uh, that. Uh, certainly most people don't seem to uh, like that. One reason is that we realize that we lose any motivation to do anything because everything which is more than the others have is taken away uh, from us. Um, so then we might ask, what are people likely to agree about? And for example, if it's true that, for example, providing at least relatively talented young people the opportunity of higher education is really more or less good for all members of society because they, be, they will become the more productive, innovative, discover new things, uh, start enterprises, etc. So it's also good for those who do not go to higher education. So. Uh, but then we are really back to the question, do we have a policy that's really uh, respecting the concerns of, um, of every uh, people? And I think uh, the economic arguments about positive externalities, for example, can, for example, explain what, what are the maybe public services that we think everybody should, uh, should be uh, entitled to. Maybe another economic argument, uh, for example, about health care, maybe, is that everybody can become ill or seriously ill. Okay? Maybe I have an accident, I just happen to, to catch uh, some, some really bad illness. Maybe we can all agree that if somebody happens to be so unfortunate, then other people should help him. So it's a kind of insurance. Okay? So even though first it seems that, oh, we are just helping those people who are ill, but actually we have a policy which helps all of us because all of us might at some point become ill. So then again, we have some, some common interest. You are bringing up the 
maybe these are kind of uh, these are the kinds of regulations that more or less would enjoy a consensus or close to it. So more most people would agree to this voluntarily. But what if what if they just don't? What if they vote another way, and then it's an inefficient, unjust uh, way of living? Then isn't there uh, another actor that should come in and do some create some regulations anyway, even though a lot of people are not agreeing with this? Right, this is a sort of Deus ex machina argument. Who is this other actor? The state or well, whoever the state is. state is us. Our state is comprised of, mem of s at least some members of society, of officials, elected politicians, maybe voters. So when we say, oh, the state should do something, that basically means the society should organize itself in a certain way. Okay? We should elect and accept some officials. Maybe don't elect them, just maybe suffer them when we have a non-elected monarch, for example. But still, we have some organization of society where some people make choices. So I don't think they, the argument that somebody outside society should do something is it really just doesn't make sense in in this form i mean i can add something to this maybe <clears throat> i mean there's if you take a very concrete example of such a situation it's like um, gambling <laughs> so you probably know what gambling is right so it basically means you're trying to make money but usually you lose <laughs> uh, the way gambling is set up is that on expectation you will lose okay so most people will lose some people will be lucky uh, and this is something that sometimes society will get together and say well, you know what we don't want this to happen this is a long it's old this is ancient that uh, societies uh, <laughs> have had rules against gambling okay and that's something that you probably can agree on and then the society you can say okay do we want to allow gambling or not <laughs> and then we have a vote again and maybe this vote will then say okay yeah the society doesn't want to have gambling we don't want to allow it okay. but there's one problem i wanted to mention earlier that <laughs> Um, these are all fairly simple societal decisions, okay? What I mentioned before, speed limits, yes, we can probably find this through a societal process, through some political process. Whether we want to have gambling or not, yes, we can probably do this. Whether we, how much taxes we want to have petrol, yes, we probably can decide on this. It becomes more problematic in politics, if you like, uh, in the society to agree on more complex things. Like, for example, which region of Hungary should receive how much money for developing support or something? <laughs> Now, this is a much more complex problem. It's not so, we would say as mathematicians, it's not unidimensional, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah, they want, so this group will want this, this group will want that, but they have other preferences of neighboring counties. I don't know what, you know. So this may be more complicated. And then what we do know, actually, from uh, the formal science of social choice, it'll be that we run into what's called impossibility theorems, which means that it's actually on, this is something I hope you will learn, there's something called arrows like the arrow, but it after, named after a person, Ken Arrow. You can Google it, Arrow's Impossibility Theorem. This is on Wikipedia, I'm sure it's fairly good. Um, but you can, what you run into, the problem is that if you allow, if there are many, many different things we could do as a society, and every one of us has different preferences about what we would like to have, there is actually no, for, no useful rule that would aggregate these preferences into one collective decision. So, this is, so in some sense we will never get, so this is like a political failure, if you like. So I told you before there were market failures, right? So markets don't always sort things out. Sometimes society will then make it happen by voting on these things and that will work. But these are only under very uh, uh, restringent assumptions. If you have a too complex problem, actually there is no solution that works. Maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe I give you one example, it's a bit abstract, <laughs> but... Um, uh, I, this, uh, this example is less abstract. So this is something I'm a bit of uh, familiar with now. So a neighbor of my father's has forest. Okay, he owns forest, and he would like to turn this forest into building land to make it a property. Okay, so to, to, to why? I mean, you probably know why, because forest is worth nothing. Okay, essentially, so one square meter of forest in Austria is worth, worth two euros or something. One square meter of building land is worth three hundred or something like this. So you, you would 150 times multiply your, the value of your land if you turn it into property. But my father is not happy with this, <laughs> okay? And all the neighbors are also not happy with this. But how unhappy are they exactly? Okay, so what would you need? You, so if you want to do a good collective decision, what would you do? You'd say, okay, look at, let's get all the people together that are involved in this, okay? And we ask them, you know, so how do you feel about this being made, okay? And when would you want it to be made? You would want this to be turned into building land if the total surplus, if you like, if the total benefit is better than the total cost, if you like, right? But now if you ask my father how much, is he, 
how much would he want to have compensation for this being built? He would say a million, two million. I don't know. He was like, ah, euros I'm talking about, okay? So uh, you would, and so if you say, no, 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 tell me honestly, honestly, how much, is it? why would you tell them honestly how much this is worth to you, okay? So this is a bit of a problem to, to get this. So it's basically almost a little bit impossible to make this decision in such a way that it, should own, that it will be done only when it should be done. I don't know whether you completely understood what I'm talking about. I mean, this can be made completely understandable. I'm just not able to do so in so short a time, I think. But in principle, there's this problem that, yeah, all these people involved would like to say, no, this is worth a lot to me. So I really hate this building going up, okay? But actually, in reality, if you had given them 10,000 euros, they would be happy, okay? But if you had given them 10, why not 20, okay? They say, no, 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 10 is not enough. I want 20. No, no, 20 is not enough. I want 30, okay? So the problem is that you don't know what they want, okay? So... Um, and so then, basically, because of this, there are these results in economics or in social choice that mean that actually there is no way to actually come up with a perfect decision in this case. I'm not sure whether the alternative is often that the, the Bürgermeister in Austria does this, which means the, the mayor, and that's not great either. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, sorry. I wanted to touch on one more often used argument for regulation, which is very special circumstances. For example, and like Caro uh, argued for stable constitution, mm. very difficult procedures to make uh, regulations so that everybody agrees or as many people agree as possible and it's as good of a, a regulation as we can make it. But that's a slow process that reacts relatively slowly to like very quickly arising problems. So for example, let's take a war. So we have a war and then it's, let's say it's efficient for a country to focus on defenses, right, and, and conscript people, but voluntarily most people wouldn't want to be conscripted as soldiers, right? So that's some sort of a regulation. And it's also if we have to go to all the constitutional matters, then the argument is that, you know, that country that, you know, is doing all these democratic things will be slower than, let's say, a more autocratic country that can impose regulations very quickly and will be very flexible in that sense, and then they will win the war or it will be at an advantage. So what would you say to regulation in such an extreme circumstances? Well, basically, I think you are talking about the limits of consensus. Okay. Uh, now, when you have a dictator, which means just one person making decisions for everyone, that's one extreme case. Consensus is the other. When you have one or more majorities discussing things and having to agree, then you are moving away from consensus towards dictatorship, but you are still far from dictatorship. So um, one thing you can do is um, that you consider two things. One is that for a certain case, how likely it is that the majority will harm the minority. For example, does it concern something really very fundamental, like rights of conscience, religion, or, or rights to life? Okay? So those decisions uh, should probably uh, be made, uh, maybe not by consensus, but something close to it. Now, there are maybe uh, not so uh, uh, far-reaching or fundamental choices for them, maybe for some temporal practical decisions, what should be the speed limit, uh, shall we build a road in this direction or that direction, hey, that might be a hurt minority, but not a tragedy. So for, some, for such choices, you might hope practically for maybe a smaller circle of elected politicians or public officials making uh, the choice. But when you have to decide very quickly uh, during one night what to do with an attacking enemy, obviously uh, you have to decide uh, very quickly. So this is the other type of cost, the cost of decision making. So you weigh the costs of the majority uh, harming the minority, and the other aspect is the cost of decision making. And the cost of decision making tend to be uh, especially high when you have to make very quick decisions. That's why typically for foreign policy, you don't have a lot of referenda, uh, whereas about, I don't know, where to build uh, a hospital or which way the road should go, then you could keep discussing it uh, for, for some time. So there is a trade-off between uh, 
majority hurting minority, and decision-making costs. And, and that's why you have, uh, for more fundamental things, maybe you require also in Hungary um, a bigger than simple majority, a qualified majority for fundamental choices, for smaller scale practical decisions or those who have, which have to be made very quickly, uh, you go for something which is closer to dictatorship. So you would say that in certain areas, something closer to dictatorship is fine, but in most areas... Um... I think, yes, the question, again, I would pose the question, can we agree on this? Or can we agree that we shouldn't have a referendum on uh, responding quickly to uh, foreign policy challenges? Probably we can agree, we say, oh, maybe they will uh, make bad choices, maybe they will make choices that hurt many minorities, but still it's better than uh, not making a choice. So I think uh, about delegating responsibility and power, uh, we can agree more easily for those things. But if it's the question is, should the government be allowed to kill me if other people don't like me? Of course, probably I would say I would never agree. I mean, I just, <clears throat> and this is a very tricky uh, question. I mean, so, I mean, all I can say is that there are, um, so whether, which, which form of government is best, okay? This is just an unopened question. I mean, this is, well, it's actually, well, unanswered question is, okay, let's say there is an answer, which is that we can't answer this question, I think. <laughs> I mean, this is how I understand this impossibility results, okay? There is no way to design a perfect society. That's what I was trying to say earlier, in some sense, okay? It's not clear that, uh, so we know that democracy has lots of, I mean, no country really practices full democracy. I mean, maybe Switzerland is the best, closest approximation. But I don't get asked about every subject that we get government makes policy. I don't get asked, you know, should I do a vote for this or yes or no? I don't know. Most, most of the time, it's like a package deal. And the problem is that uh, um, there is no result that in the literature that says democracy is best. I mean, there is best under certain circumstances, okay? There are some, some, some restrictions, but not in all possible cases. Uh, of, there's also no the other round. There's no dictatorship is best. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, so this is just a very difficult question, I guess. Okay, thank you. Uh, now I open the floor for questions. Does anybody have burning question that they would like to ask <laughs> our discussants? They Please raise your burning. hand if you do. <laughs> Speak up, yes. <laughs> you have justice with a uh, kind of climate regulation where there's the idea that most climate regulation actually disproportionately affects poor people. Mm -hmm. And it's mainly designed by richer people, and all the negatives are just kind of poor and poor people. It's easy example of South Africa, where a lot of rich countries, developed countries, say the UK, America, are kind of trying to buy coal where all the greenhouse gases and everything. But South Africa, a developing nation, needs to rely on coal, and they have these big problems of power cuts, quality of life going down because of that. So is it actually just to impose this ban on coal in South Africa, which is a developing nation and has nothing to actually cope with that? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I think your example is uh, actually quite similar to the example of, of prohibiting uh, uh, traditional petrol-fueled cars uh, from the perspective of, of poverty. I mean, who are buying electric cars nowadays? I don't think it's, it's, it's the poor people. Of course, there are other aspects as well. For example, I don't drive a lot, so I think it wouldn't really make much sense for me to change my car to anything else, to build another car for me just because it's more environmental friendly if I use my car three times a year. Uh, but uh, yes, so um, many, uh, many times regulations that try to increase quality, restrict uh, choices with potentially uh, negative external effects are in fact uh, products or services bought uh, more by the poor or maybe uh, in equal measure but out of their income more is spent on such goods. So um, one possible solution is, as I suggested, to go for more general rules. So instead of prohibiting this industry or that industry, say that everyone who contributes to climate change through greenhouse gas emissions uh, should be taxed
accordingly. Already, I think you, not perfectly, but to some extent, practically speaking, you do limit the possibilities that you sort of pick and target. Uh, and the influential groups who have more influence on public policy can sort of shift the burden to others. Now, but there are limits to this. So one other option, which actually comes, comes up in, in climate uh, negotiations, is to include compensations or bundle together different choices. Maybe prohibiting one industry is bad for South Africa, prohibiting another industry is bad for the US. Or maybe something is really uh, costly for one country, but then the other countries agree to some form of uh, compensation, maybe foreign aid. Of course, this can become really very complex. So there is also the fundamental question, perhaps, we shouldn't make any such collective choice if we are really afraid of uh, very bad outcomes. So you always have this, uh, you should always have this question in mind, to what extent you go into regulating something where you can do uh, a lot of harm to, to some uh, social uh, uh, groups. But I can add one more thing quickly. So, I mean, I completely completely that stuff. So, if you had a universal uh, regulation for the whole globe, which we have a struggle, we're struggling to have, uh, then it would affect poorer countries disproportionately, right? Uh, but of course, there would be ways around it, right? You could have what we call side payments. You could have other things that you promise, right? I mean, you could say the US would promise South Africa electricity in other ways, okay? So, of course, otherwise South Africa would not agree to this, okay? So, uh, but whether or not this is done is another question, okay? So, but in principle, there would be ways around this particular problem. Yeah. Maybe another thing that uh, you might try to uh, decentralize decisions, okay? So when we say, oh, to make consensual or near consensual decision for the entire globe is, is really impossible, it's likely to be very unjust, then perhaps you could go for more local solutions. This might, for example, mean that you don't want to reduce carbon emissions across the globe in one way or another, but maybe your concern is, I don't know, forest fires, okay? So there are other ways to reduce forest fires, maybe invest in in forest fire management, landscaping, whatever. Okay? So from a practical point of view, uh, although sort of in, in principle or in a textbook, a global solution might seem much better, uh, actually from a practical point of view, also in terms of justice, uh, going maybe for less but more local so that people can agree uh, may be a better choice. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Um, I am so. Do I understand correctly that? Do I understand correctly that we are just suggesting that uh, instead of a global negative externality, uh, the local effects should be tackled? So the the local effects should be tackled. So <coughs> have you suggested that? Because whenever we like it or not. The fundamental cause of greenhouse gas emission is global. So you can't uh, tackle. Um, so only solving that in a local area is something of a moot point. Uh, but the examples you gave for what could be done instead are more focused on the effects of uh, this problem than the causes. I can say something if you like. <laughs> uh, what do you think about? Uh, you have spoken about the uh, cost of global action uh, to regulatory processes, which uh, have uh, negative outcomes, especially for uh, poor regions or things like that. But what do you think about the cost cost of inaction in this case? Uh, is it morally acceptable to have an attitude to that uh, seeks to do no harm instead of uh, reduce already existing harm? I mean, so 
I can't speak so much to the moral things. I mean, I, I, <laughs> but what I so the first question was a little bit like uh, if I have a per, uh, climate change is a global problem. I think that's true, as my understanding is. And can we deal with this by having local solutions to this? And I guess not. <laughs> um, so I guess, uh, but what, 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 I mean, so that's also why we are struggling to have like a complete climate agreement, right? I mean, there are these agreements that are all not that strong. And it's because at the global scale, politics is very weak, right? What can you do? So let's say, um, even if you come to some agreement, let's say, and let's say a big country like the US suddenly doesn't want to do it anymore. What could the rest of the world do to to avoid this? Okay, if they don't want to do it anymore, I mean, you're not going to start a war with the United States. Okay, so uh, there's very little. You can't. I mean, you can't in, enforce this. Okay, so um, so I guess this is. Uh, so that's why I think we are struggling to come up with some sort of global agreement. And I agree, local agreement, local things will not help that much. Right? I mean, so, but I don't know about morality. You can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, then, yes, maybe first regarding your, your second question. I think these questions are much more complicated. And I think this is true of almost, almost any government policy I, I, I can think of. That it's not a question of moral right or wrong, so to say. You go for this policy and this is right, and you oppose it, or you go for something else, and that's wrong. Um, of course, you can have this as a personal opinion, but I think there are legitimate uh, disagreements, okay? So if you compare it with, I think, very clear ca case, uh, just I want to kill an innocent person, it's very clearly wrong. All of us can agree, okay? But what to do about climate changes? Should we uh, reduce the carbon emissions or instead try to... I don't know, develop technologies which protect us from climate change? Uh, should we have taxes or should we have uh, technological prescriptions? Should we go just entirely globally or should Europe do something on their own? These are legitimate disagreements. Now concerning decentralization, uh, of course, uh, you may have, uh, you probably have a global problem. Greenhouse gases are a, a global problem. Uh, what I meant to suggest is that you take seriously um, the possibilities to decentralize decision making. I think you have two ways. You cannot fully decentralize them, probably. Uh, one thing is that you go for general rules. For example, you don't say, oh, no country should produce or use um, petrol or diesel-fueled cars. But instead, you have a more general rule. All countries should tax uh, the greenhouse emissions, or the, the most important activities. Why is it decentralization? Because then you leave it to Hungary or Austria or Finland to decide whether the best way to comply with this general rule is to give up um, traditional cars or maybe leave them but maybe focus on, um, I don't know, uh, energy production or use of energy in some, some heavy industry and focus on, on that. The other uh, aspect with externalities is um, for an externality, um, you always have two sides. For Taylor Swift, you have uh, Taylor Swift singing loudly and you have the neighbors who suffer. Basically, you have two solutions for uh, doing away with this externality. Taylor Swift stops singing or sings only indoors. The other solution is that the people move from the neighborhood or don't even move there in the first place. Okay. Now, first you might think this, the second one is, is not very nice. But in fact, from a social point of view, this might be often uh, a good solution. Maybe you can even compensate people for moving somewhere else. Uh, but maybe the costs of this, and by compensating the people, they can be relatively happy, are much less than not having uh, large-scale uh, concerts. So for climate change, you reduce the externality, the greenhouse gases, or maybe, maybe to be a little bit provocative, there is heat, so you use uh, more air conditioning. Okay? So at least some effects of uh, heat waves uh, in terms of uh, higher mortality and health effects can be reduced by that way. 
Maybe you focus on new types of air conditioning, which do not emit a lot of gases, whatever. So you focus on the other side. Or you build um, uh, uh, maybe um, some protection against floods or rising sea levels. Maybe you don't want to prevent the sea level rising, but you want to prevent it um, uh, harming the city. So. That these, these are always um, uh, the choices you have to consider. Maybe you dismiss these choices, but still um, they can be considered and they can be more local than uh, on the other side. Thanks. Any more questions? We have time for that. Go ahead. Justness of a decision by failing like met externally. For example, like let's take it back to the university. So let's say like we have 5 million diehard citizens, 2 million of them can go to a concert cheaply. So we say like these 2 million people will be happy so that they can go to a concert, but this is 2 million positive externalities. But the rest of the 3 million people who could not participate in this concert will be sad. So this is 3 million like uh, negative externalities. So this decision is, is the good or not? can be like um, weighed in this perspective of like uh, net uh, externality. I mean, so the question was if, uh, yeah, so if you have high Taylor Swift tickets and only half of her fans can basically go to one ticket, they were like, lucky and they're happy. So um, I, what I would uh, say is that this is uh, a situation that is not efficient because uh, it's not the people who want to go to the concert the most that go there necessarily, right? It's just the lucky ones. So it doesn't have to be that <laughs> we didn't necessarily pick the right people in some sense. So there may be people who didn't get a ticket, but who really, 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 really would have wanted to. And they would have now been happy to pay an, a higher price, let's say. And, and somebody else would have been happy to sell this ticket now. But let's say we can't allow this. So, but if you then have a, if then the price was so high that only the diehard fans, they, there's a, no, a smaller group of diehard fans who can now go, go this is not what we would call an improvement for everybody, right? Obviously not. So they are difficult to compare in terms of fairness, okay? I mean, in fact, I would say you can't really compare. I mean, it depends whether, if you identify a lot with the people who just didn't get a ticket, well, then you will see this is unfair. If you identify a lot with the people who could get a ticket, well, I don't know, it depends how you see things, right? So um, my view would be that this, in some sense, this is hard to uh, make a fairness comparison between the two. Carrie, do you have anything to add? Yes, this? maybe one thing that actually we live with a lot of externalities. Like we can have a society without externalities if everybody lives on a separate island. Like so, we don't want to do away with all externalities. Then <laughs> we couldn't have a city. Like it's full of positive, but also very many negative uh, externalities. There are a lot of externalities we can relatively easily deal with, if that's. You know, I do something which is really bad for you, but it's not really important for me. Then usually uh, I refrain from doing it. We, we uh, don't even need maybe ethics or morality. It's just good manners. Okay, so most of the accident is dealt with good manners. And then we have more serious conflicts. Uh, and then we have to solve them uh, somehow. We have the concert girls uh, and the neighbors. So what do we do? Uh, one direction is maybe try to go into uh, the direction of voluntary agreements. Now, if you have just two neighbors, maybe your father and, and maybe um, a few other neighbors, it's uh, not uh, unrealistic. And economics, um, I think, uh, uh, economists spend a lot of time trying to figure out when you can have successful voluntary uh, agreements. But obviously, with uh, millions of people, you cannot do that. So uh, you, then you have some kind of, of government intervention, somebody making a decision um, instead of uh, people coming to an agreement. And then these are really the tough issues. How do you compare the harms and the benefits of these people? Because if you ask them, of course, everybody will say, oh, I really... I will die tonight if there is another concert. The concert girl, oh, I will commit suicide if I can't get to see Taylor Swift. So uh, just asking people is not enough. Then you ask experts, but the experts should know what is in the people's heads, but they don't know. Okay, so 
if uh, by the end of the third year of the PP program, <laughs> you will have some good ideas about it. At least I think you will see how difficult it is to, to, to solve such uh, uh, thorny issues. Um, thank you. Question. Um, but we don't really have any more time. Um, if it's a short question, we can go for it. Okay, make it loud, please. Yeah, uh, was uh, your example about the Taylor Swift concert that people can move away or Taylor Swift can sing in a closed uh, space. But what if we change it out and, for example, the, um, instead of Taylor Swift, there's, uh, for example, a uh, battery or an accum accumulator um, factory. That is uh, making changes towards, um, for example, they are making electric vehicles. It's good for the environment, but it, the, the factory is not good for the people who are living um, next to the factory. Uh, the factory is polluting the air, it is polluting the water, and uh, the people can't really move away because they don't have I don't know, the means or uh, it's their uh, ancestral home and uh, it's, it, they it don't was want to. their property mm -hmm. even before the, the uh, fact that they moved there. The government's stance is that uh, it's great uh, to have a, a factory here because uh, it's good for the economy of the uh, given country. I think it's... Uh, we can, we can talk about Hungary here because the government stance is that we should be a, um, an accumulator or uh, like a, a electricizing um, country. But like what, what, what could be the solution to this, uh, this problem? I have a very quick solution. It's compensation. <laughs> but of course, the problem is a little bit that uh, you don't know how much to compensate. Okay, so, <laughs> and then we have these exaggeration issues. But in principle, the people could be compensated. And if you ask people, usually they will be willing to accept a certain amount of money for this factory being there. The question is, of course, how high this would be. <laughs> okay, and that may not be truthful about this. So there is a bit of fundamental problem. Okay, but there's also a possibility of solving it a bit, okay, in some cases. That's my quick solution. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, the, the other way, if you want to go in the direction of voluntary agreement, is giving the rights of these homeowners to um, freedom from uh, bad health effects. So it's like you have the right. So if I suffer from uh, the company, or even if I'm exposed to a health danger, then maybe I can go to a court and uh, make uh, the activity of the factory uh, stop. Okay. Um, in some cases, when a neighbor is disturbing uh, the others, you might have s such legal solutions. Okay. But so imagine that the homeowners have these rights. Okay. Will we ever have a battery factory in Hungary? Perhaps. Perhaps far away from where people live. So maybe that's not a bad solution. But maybe we can't really have them so far away that they are never heard. So we might end up, with, if we stick to this rule that they must agree and they can make uh, the court prohibit the hurting activity, we might end up without any, uh, without any negative externality, but also without any battery factories. Okay, so perhaps... Um, uh, in theory, this sounds very nice. We are protecting these people. And then we go to the other alternative. Okay, we do, we do have to have factories somewhere in the country. So somebody will not like them. And then you opt um, for compensation, which is in principle maybe not very far. Because if you say, oh, if, we had, if a person had the right to make the company stop the production, then the company could ask the person for how much would you refrain from using this right? What compensation would you accept? And if we have good public policy, good experts, then this compensation will more or less be equal to that. So then we are not very far from, from, from being just, if we are lucky. Okay, thank you very much for the very good questions. I think we had a very good debate, touched on a lot of topics that we will 
discuss more in depth during the program over the, over the course of the three years with special emphasis on Taylor Swift. Um, <laughs> Uh, the next discussion uh, is going to begin at uh, half past 11. Um, I would like to thank to the audience and the, both of the discussants for a very excellent discussion. And then we have uh, coffee and refreshments uh, for the next half an hour. So enjoy yourself and uh, we would like to see you back half an hour from now. Okay, see you then.